On June 22, 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union. Although it started on the 129th anniversary of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, Adolf Hitler and his generals were confident. The Kaiser's legions had defeated Russia in World War I, and the Soviet army had bungled the invasion of Finland. By contrast, Hitler's armies had swept most of Europe, crushing Poland and France with shocking speed. This would be no normal invasion. Hitler wanted a vast empire in the east, similar to what Germany tried to secure in 1918, but this conquest would be predicated on genocide and enslavement. For the Russians, it was a fight for survival. The cruel irony is that it was a fight in the defense of Joseph Stalin. He had already murdered millions of his own people and was every bit as ruthless as Hitler. The German army of 1941 was the finest military force in the world. German advances in armor and aircraft tactics and flexible command structure made them second to none. However, the army had weaknesses. Logistic planning was mediocre and strategic thinking often lacked realism. Indeed, the rapid fall of France made the German high command overconfident and they overestimated how easily they could crush Stalin's army. By contrast, the Red Army was tactically poor and rigid. Stalin had wiped out many of his officers before 1941, creating a leadership crisis. Although Stalin had more aircraft and tanks than Hitler, they were often of inferior design and wed to poor tactical arrangements. In 1941, the Soviets lost a series of battles that would have destroyed any other army on Earth. However, most Soviet males had to serve in the army, which meant Stalin could draw from millions of men with military training. It was with these vast reserves that Stalin was able to shore up the front and hold on. Despite Germany's initial success, the fighting in the summer of 1941 had been intense and replacements could not keep up with losses. More importantly, Hitler and his generals had not decided where the main thrust should be. Hitler favored the South with its rich resources, particularly oil. The generals mostly wanted to take Moscow, thinking the fall of the capital would end the war. Both arguments had merit, but in the end, Hitler agreed to drive on Moscow in late 1941 at the behest of his generals. Although the army came within sight of the city, German logistics collapsed. The weather turned bitterly cold, and the Soviets launched a massive counterattack. Although the Germans held on, they came close to collapse. During the crisis, Hitler removed Walther von Brochtig as head of the army and made himself the sole commander. For 1942, Hitler decided on a southern offensive aimed at the oil of the Caucasus region. The attack was a success, and the Soviet forces melted away. However, the Russians managed to retreat fast enough to avoid a more thorough defeat. Stalin gave the order, not a step back, and declared, Hitler's impetuosity has once again prevailed. He has chosen a path that leads nowhere but to overextension and defeat. That defeat may take place along the Don, in the Caucasus, at Moscow, or in all three locations. What is clear, however, is that a stubborn and determined Red Army will prevail. It is just a matter of time. Stalin's assessment was correct, as German forces were drawn towards Stalingrad. While the Soviets tried to cobble together a coherent defense in the south, Georgi Zhukov hammered Germany's army group center near Rezev. The road through Rezev was the shortest to Berlin, and Zhukov favored a counteroffensive to launch a war-winning drive to the west. In addition, many thought Moscow was Germany's true target in 1942, and Zhukov wanted that threat neutralized. The Fernz Offensive came at Bryansk and was a failure. In August, Zhukov struck the 9th Army at Rezev, but the attack was rebuffed. Although they failed to break the German lines, the attacks did gain ground, and 9th Army was nearly destroyed. The German command directed the bulk of its reserves to reinforce Army Group Center, including eight divisions. Hitler canceled an airborne landing at Batumi that he had designated for October 1942 and ordered the parachute forces rushed to Smolensk. The August battles deprived the Germans at Stalingrad of vital forces. After the August battles, Zhukov argued for simultaneous offensives. One would be pointed at Stalingrad, where the German army was battling in the ruins of the city. The other would be aimed at Army Group Center. 
The Stalingrad attack would be called Operation Uranus, and the attack at Rezev would be dubbed Operation Mars. Zhukov hoped to be victorious at both locations. Alexander Vasilevsky and Nikolai Vatutin, the other two Russians involved in high command planning, were opposed to attacking Army Group Center, but neither pressed their case. In the end, Stalin agreed to both offensives. Zhukov would oversee Operation Mars, a two-phase attack intended to destroy Army Group Center. Vasilevsky would oversee Operation Uranus, which would entrap the Axis forces in Stalingrad. Operation Mars would occur first, which means it is likely Stalin did consider it a diversion. Regardless, Zhukov was involved in the planning of both, and Operation Mars was delayed until November 25th. Zhukov by then hoped the colder weather would make river crossings easier. He also thought the attack would benefit from coming after Operation Uranus, which might draw German reserves away from Rezev. Zhukov even said, In the event Uranus fails, we will still be in a good position to succeed in Mars. Zhukov was Stalin's most successful commander. He was ruthless, willful, and had a strong grasp of strategy and operations. His career began in the Tsarist army, where he twice won the Cross of St. George. He joined the Bolsheviks in 1917 and became a noted cavalry commander. He survived the Great Purge in large part because Stalin did not go after cavalry officers. He gained notoriety for defeating the Japanese and for his skill in war games. His defense of Leningrad and Moscow in 1941 meant that by 1942 he was the Russian commander with the most clout. As such, for Operation Mars, he succeeded in getting his way in terms of planning and resource allocation. Zhukov relied on two commanders from Mars. Ivan Konev led the Western Front. He was a veteran of World War I and joined the Bolsheviks in 1918. He earned a reputation for ruthlessness in the Russian Civil War. During World War II, he even enjoyed watching tanks roll over German corpses. Although his forces were destroyed in the defense of Moscow, Zhukov saw great potential in Konev and shielded him from Stalin's wrath. In time, Konev became Stalin's favorite commander. Konev supported Zhukov's plans for Operation Mars and was eager to strike, but he knew the Germans were veterans in strong defensive positions. He had no illusions that the coming battle would be difficult. Maxim Perkayev led the Kalin in front. He was considered one of the best staff officers in the army and was among Zhukov's favorite commanders. He was quiet, bookish, and an exacting planner. He had done well as commander of 3rd Shock Army, and Zhukov relied heavily on Perkayev in planning Operation Mars. Konev would attack only with the 20th and the 31st Army, and take Sichavka. Perkayev was to take Belyai with the 41st Army, which was considered among the best Soviet formations. For the offensive, it was reinforced with the 1st and 2nd Mechanized Corps. Perkayev's 22nd and 39th Armies were to take Olenino, in a pincer attack designed and intended to destroy the Germans in the area. Both armies would then turn on Belyai, and at the same time, Perkayev's third shock army would strike German forces at Velkiai Luki, mostly hoping to divert resources and attention. However, at the last minute, Zhukov bolstered third shock army by transferring second mechanized corps to their sector. After the Rezev salient was crushed, Konev was to launch Operation Jupiter, and envelop and destroy all German forces east of Smolensk. Further deep operations were then to be carried out by the 9th and 10th Tank Corps and the 3rd Tank Army. Zhukov deployed 1,100 aircraft and 10,000 artillery pieces, slightly more than was used in Operation Uranus. Zhukov assembled more tanks for Mars than were used in any other Soviet offensive up to that time, although exactly how many is debated. It could have been as few as 1,700 or as many as 2,300. The tactical plan was for the massed artillery to blast holes in the German lines after a short but sharp barrage. The infantry would then rupture the lines and be followed by the tanks. Unfortunately for Zhukov and his men, they faced some of the best defensive tacticians in the German army. Gunther von Kluge commanded Army Group Center. He was known by the nickname Clever Hans. He had an odd relationship with Hitler. He was critical of Nazi ideology and many anti-Nazi officers served in his staff. Kluge knew of their plans to kill Hitler, but
but did not actively support them. Although Hitler did not trust him, Kluge was often able to get his way with Hitler by using his considerable charm. As a commander, Kluge was capable at both attack and defense. The 9th Army was commanded by Walter Modell. He was a tough defensive fighter with an attention to detail that few commanders possessed. Modell was acquiescent to Nazism even if he was not a true believer like fellow generals Walter von Reichenau and Ernest Busch. His defensive innovations were a key reason the Germans held on to Rezev through 1942. Modell concentrated his mounted reconnaissance troops into a reserve brigade, had the 5th Panzer Division form a ski battalion, and place his artillery under High Artillery Command 307. This allowed Modell to move artillery batteries around with greater ease and concentrate firepower. In addition, Modell improved tactical intelligence gathering through infantry patrolling, which allowed him to quickly react. Lastly, Modell built a continuous defensive front. The first line was made up of forward observers who could use telephones to call in artillery. Against Hitler's orders, Modell had fallback positions and fortified posts created, giving 9th Army a defense in depth. Modell's task was made easier by new anti-tank weapons and tactics. In 1940, an armored division could easily cut up an infantry division, but it was no longer the case in 1942. Modell relied on two rising stars in the German army who served as his main panzer commanders. Hans-Jürgen von Arnhem came from a Prussian family who had fought in the military since 1388. Four of his relatives were generals in World War II. Arnhem saw wide service in World War I. He was a reliable Nazi, and his promotion was delayed by officers who disliked his politics. Nevertheless, he was considered a first-rate organizer and well thought of by his peers. He did well in command of panzer forces despite little experience. He was noted for being brave, a tireless worker, and staying calm in tough situations. Joseph Harp was Modell's favorite. He was an early advocate of armored warfare and even studied at the secret German-Russian comma tank school in Kazan in 1931. He had a knack for defensive warfare that was unusual for men trained in tank warfare. As October turned to November, Reinhard Galen, head of Foreign Armies East, warned Modell that an attack was coming. George Buntrock, Modell's own intelligence chief, agreed with Galen and even figured out Zhukov's plans. In addition, an agent in Moscow named Max informed Kluge of the attack and two other Soviet offensives. Tellingly, though, the informant said nothing of Operation Uranus. In reaction, Kluge called the 12th Panzer Division north to Rezev. Modell heavily reinforced threatened sectors. He had double lines of bunkers built and laid mines and cut down trees to improve fields of fire. Modell visited the front daily and positioned the 1st, 5th, and 9th Panzer Division to blunt any attack. They only had 157 tanks, but plenty of fuel and ammunition. The men were also veterans. Modell thought the main Soviet thrust would come from Konev's sector and placed his strongest reserves there. It was his only major miscalculation, as the greater weight of the attack was with Perkayev's forces. Operation Uranus was launched on November 19th. It came as a shock to the Axis and was a stunning success. By November 23rd, Stalingrad was completely surrounded. Yet, when Kluge was asked if he could spare men for the Stalingrad front, he said, If we could barely hold in August, what shall we do in November or December without critical operational reserves? Similarly, when Stalin considered transferring the 2nd Guards Army to the Stalingrad front, Zhukov said, Remember where Moscow is, and remember that Smolensk lies along the shortest route to Berlin. Both men got their way. Operation Mars was launched in the early hours of November 25, 1942. It got off to a bad start, as the artillery barrage was inaccurate, mostly due to the weather. The initial Soviet advance on Konev's front was made by Strafbots. These were penal battalions. They were made of soldiers who were criminals, cowards, political unreliables, or people who were being punished for retreating. Germans held their fire until the Soviet regular infantry attacked. 
Soviets yelled the battle cry, Yura! All it did was alert the Germans that the main attack was underway. Soviet losses were appalling, and the supporting tank brigades were wrecked. However, elements of 20th Army did bend back the lines, forcing Arnhem to commit his reserves. All in all, the first day of Operation Mars was a fiasco. Konev decided enough gains had been made to commit more armor on November 26th. The Soviet attacks were savage, and the lines nearly burst open. However, German anti-tank guns took a fearful toll on Konev's armor. The Soviets could not press ahead, and heated arguments broke out in the high command. Zhukov and Konev even made open threats to their commanders. Still, the renewed attacks were delayed, giving the Germans precious time to organize a more coherent defense. German artillery was also accurate, and sporadic barrages broke up Russian troop movements. The Luftwaffe provided some Stuka sorties, which hit the traffic jam in Konev's rear. On November 28th, a penetration was made into the German lines. Soviet cavalry, including Cossacks, were used to exploit the breach. However, the weather, confusion at the bridge crossings, and the poor conditions of the roads did not allow Konev to bring his full force to bear. Even worse, the artillery was still behind the Vazuza River. On the night of November 28th, Kukov asked Stalin to send Konev fresh divisions. Stalin refused, but urged Zhukov to continue his attacks. That same day, Stalin wrote to Franklin Roosevelt, We've decided to undertake an operation on the Central Front as well, in order to impede the enemy from sending forces to the south. Arnhem counterattacked on November 29th at the 5th and 9th Panzer Divisions, which cut off Konev's breakthrough group. That night, the Soviets escaped the pocket. The fighting was severe, and most of the remaining tanks were lost. At one point, Russian cavalry mounted a classic charge against an armored train with their sabers in the air. The formation was all but annihilated. Arnhem, though, did not remain long after a successful attack. On December 1st, he was sent to Tunisia, where he fared less well than he did on the Russian front. Perkayev's three-pronged offensive had more success than Konev's offensive. The 41st Army's attack was spearheaded by the 6th Stalin Volunteer Rifle Corps. It was made up of men deported to Siberia who had volunteered to go to the front. In savage combat, they destroyed the 2nd Luftwaffe Field Division. Yet losses were so great, the entire 1st Mechanized Corps was thrown in. They breached the lines and raced to Belly Eye before being stopped by the 1st Panzer Division. After the battle, Modell declared, the division will live forever in the history of the Army, as the Panzer Division, which, in the most difficult situations, never failed. The 22nd Army breached the lines and moved upon Olenino. The famed Groff Deutschland Division counterattacked the 22nd Army and smashed the spearhead of the 3rd Mechanized Corps. The 39th Army to the north also advanced towards Olenino. Losses were heavy though, and the gains were only modest. One German soldier near Olenino wrote, On my sector, the sights were terrible. Fallen Russian and German soldiers lay quietly side by side. It was an apocalypse of death. On December 3rd, 30th Army attacked northwest of Rezev, and the 39th Army tried to take Chertolino. The attacks were stopped cold. By the beginning of December, the Kalinin Front's offensive was bogged down, although they had come close to ripping apart the German defenses. One problem was that Perkayev had no reserves since Zhukov had detailed 2nd Mechanized Corps for the Velki Lyuki offensive. Ironically, that offensive meant as a diversion was a success and resulted in Velikai Lauki being retaken. Throughout the offensive, Modell was able to assess which threats were the most dangerous and move his reserves accordingly. He believed Perkayev was on the brink of a major breakthrough. He convinced Cluj to send him the 12th, 19th, and 20th Panzer Divisions. Once they arrived, Modell counterattacked and destroyed 41st Army's leading spearheads. On December 7th, near Belii, much of the 1st Mechanized Corps and the remnants of the 6th Stalin Volunteer Rifle Corps were encircled. The pocket was commanded by Major General M.D. Solomatin. Every day, the Germans asked Solomatin to surrender, and he refused each time. In the pocket, the men were subjected to heavy artillery fire, while the Soviet Air Force could only drop a trickle of supplies. Zhukov blamed his subordinates for the failed offensive. Several were relieved. 
Zhukov even took personal command of the 41st Army at one point. He launched repeated attacks aimed at rescuing Solomatin's men. By December 15th, it was clear that Solomatin's men were doomed. Zhukov ordered them to break out. It was by now clear the Soviet offensive had completely failed. Stalin himself called off the operation, and by December 20th, the fighting in the Rezev salient was over. Zhukov, though, was in denial. After the battle ended, he visited 39th Army and awarded General A.I. Zygon and military council member V.P. Boyko personalized watches for taking the city of Olenino. In reality, Olenino was in German hands and remained so until March 4th, 1943. Losses at Operation Mars are still debated, but it appears the Germans lost 40,000 men while inflicting anywhere from 200 to 300,000 losses on the Soviets. Tank casualties were particularly bad and some 1,600 Russian vehicles were lost. Operation Mars was the bloodiest of the 1942 attacks on Army Group Center and the area became known as the Rezev Meat Grinder. In the aftermath of Operation Mars, Kluge recommended that the salient be abandoned to conserve manpower and take up more defensive positions. The capture of Velikai Luki meant that the Russian logistical situation at Rezev was better and Kluge thought his army group could not survive another battle on the scale of Operation Mars. Hitler refused. He did not want to lose ground and he considered the position vital if he were to make a thrust against Moscow in 1943. However, when the Soviets pushed on Kharkov in February, Modell convinced Hitler that a retreat would free up eight divisions. On February 6, 1943, Hitler authorized Modell to evacuate the salient, known as Operation Buffalo. It was a brilliant success. The Germans retreated in phases starting on March 1st. By the time Konev and Perkayev detected the withdrawal, they could only launch a hasty pursuit, which led to heavy Soviet losses. In the aftermath of Operation Mars, Modell became one of Hitler's favorite commanders. By contrast, Perkayev's star was no longer ascendant. He was transferred to command the Far Eastern Front to protect against an unlikely Japanese attack. Yet he was luckier than others. Most of the Army Group commanders who fought in Operation Mars were shelved, and Perkayev played an important role in the 1945 Manchurian Offensive. It is still debated to this day if Operation Mars was a diversion an offensive equal to Stalingrad in importance, or the main Soviet thrust of November 1942. While it cannot be determined, it is possible that it was all three. Zhukov seemed to see it as equal, if not more important, than Operation Uranus. Others in the high command, particularly Stalin, saw it as more of a diversion. If Zhukov had crushed 9th Army at the same time 6th Army was being destroyed at Stalingrad, the result would have been a full disaster on the Eastern Front. Zhukov's only achievement was pinning down reserves that could have been used elsewhere. Operation Mars was later dubbed by the historian David Glantz as Zhukov's greatest defeat. Regardless, official Soviet histories barely discussed Operation Mars after the war, or simply portrayed it as a successful diversion. Soviet failure at Operation Mars was due to poor tactics, bad weather, rough terrain, and strong German defenses. There was poor coordination between units, and a misuse of artillery and aircraft. The massive armored forces that Zhukov amassed were prematurely committed before the infantry had completed their rupturing of the lines. Modell's intelligence staff concluded that despite a good Soviet plan, the battle degenerated into what they called senseless wild hammering at fixed frontline positions. They added, the Russian is never logical. He falls back on his natural instinct and the nature of the Russian is to use mass steamroller tactics and adhere to given objectives without regard to changing situations. Modell's intelligence staff would be proved wrong in the coming years. Some reforms were made after Operation Mars and Uranus. After the summer of 1943, Soviet proficiency in operational offensives markedly improved. While Modell had won one of the most impressive defensive victories of the war, it was achieved with the use of six panzer divisions. As the war went on, German reserves were rarely so robust. In addition, Modell benefited from Soviet tactical errors while the Luftwaffe had control of the skies. 
By 1944, the Red Air Force controlled the skies, and Soviet tactics had substantially improved. Few knew it, but after 1942, defensive victories like Operation Mars were increasingly rare, and a key reason Germany lost the war.